This time on Hacker News Stories of the Week, we are looking at stories from across the tech world. One of my personal favorite things as a Hacker News editor is to get to read stories from people immersed in software development. It's incredible to see the time, talent, and effort that goes into making the software that I and all of us take for granted. So today we're going to look at three stories that cover just that. First, we'll be taking a look at how someone got into software engineering. After that, we'll be reading an article that covers how low-code data scientists might be becoming more common. And finally, we'll be looking at how to keep server racks secure, which is not something we really think about. So let's just get started on the first one, how someone got started in software engineering. Articles about getting started in software development are some of the most popular on Hacker Noon. Our contributors have sent in articles that cover everything from the basics of coding and how to get started from that department, all the way up to how to answer job interviews and technical questions related to that. Our article today, however, is a little different. Lessons from my software engineering job by Carol Horison gives a different take on this conundrum. Instead of looking at how to get a job, he's looking at how to get the most out of your software engineering job after you get in. After all, passing the exams and getting basic qualifications is just the beginning. Turning that skill into a sustainable career takes a completely different skill set. For example, he looks into how to find opportunities in your very first job, the steps you could take to succeed and to open opportunities for yourself. And most importantly, how to pace yourself so that you don't burn out and so that you can continue to give your best work all the time. He covers all of these topics and more in his article. While on the topic of software development, low-code solutions are becoming more popular. Take Wix, WordPress or Squarespace, for example. Those three solutions are what we would describe as low-code or no-code. Essentially, you don't need to be a proper developer to make full use of those tools. Data science might be affected by the same trend, according to Jorge Torres in his article about the meteoric rise of the data scientist. Jorge is the co-founder and CEO of MindsDB, which specializes in in-database machine learning. As he explains, the average data scientist might have to take data from a database, load it up into business intelligence software, then load it into machine learning software, and then once he does all of that, put it back in the business intelligence solution, and then put all of that back into the database so they can get a result. It's a lot of work and it means that the pool of qualified data scientists is very small because they have to be qualified in all of those tools. Alternative solutions which tie everything into the database or low code data science as he puts it is something that his company specializes in and it is as he puts it one of the solutions to accessing a larger pool of um, labor that can properly do low code data science instead of the full form that we see today. Most of our cybersecurity articles look at keeping servers safe from hackers, how to stop someone from worming in through the software. But there is more to cybersecurity than just stopping online hacking, phishing and the like. Best Physical Security Practices for Your Server Room by Zach Amos, a features editor at Rehack, covers just that. Because as it turns out, protecting your servers isn't just online only there are physical threats one can have. For example, hackers just walking into the server room. So there are solutions for this, which he points out. Solutions like authenticated access, video cameras, and motion sensing. These might sound like the stuff of movies or might sound blatantly obvious, but it's always good to keep this in mind. But as it happens, protecting your data isn't just stopping hackers from accessing it. Making sure you actually have data is another problem, which is why he goes into solutions such as fire suppression, fire suppressants that can, for example, not destroy your data when deployed. This story, this last one, was written under the Cybersecurity Writing Contest, which has a thousand dollar prize pool, and it is still open. So if you'd like to participate, now's your chance. So that covers all of our stories this week, but we have one more thing to announce. It is the fourth annual Noonies. And for those, who, for those of you who don't know, the Noonies is an event where Hacker Noon goes out to recognize the best people on the internet best people and projects. And from now until the end of the month, you get to have a say. You can nominate anyone for any of our five categories and give them the chance to win prizes. Everything depends on which category it is. And if you'd like to know more, you can go to noonies.tech or click the link in the description below to find out more. That about wraps it up for this week and I hope that you enjoyed the video. Naturally, I only skimmed the articles. So if any of them were interesting to you, please be sure to click on their links in the description below or visit hackadoon.com to see what else we have. Please remember to like, comment, and subscribe. If you'd like to know when the next video is up, 
make sure to click on the bell icon. A special thank you to the authors featured in this video, and thanks to everyone who writes and reads on hackernoon.com.